Nice Young People, where grown-ass adults review young adult books. This week we're reviewing Carve the Mark by Veronica Roth, and I'll let Yancina give you a quick summary. Right, so Carve the Mark follows the story of Kyra and Akos, who are children of two enemy nations, I guess, that live on the same planet, and uh, they encounter each other when some prophecies about their futures are revealed, and uh, Kyra's brother kidnaps Akos. Akos. So I feel like the first thing we should discuss is really how we're going to pronounce these names. Before we get into that, we should probably say that if you've read this book and you love it, just, you know, proceed with caution. <laughs> and if you haven't read this book yet, there are going to be spoilers all over the shop, so maybe save this podcast for later. Um, but yeah, okay, so names. There are a lot of names. Not and all of them were ridiculous. <laughs> Alright, if we do the main ones. So, I've been saying Akos. What about you guys? Yeah, Akos or... Akos. Something like that. Akos. <laughs> Akos, I feel like I've also been saying. I, I feel like those are similar enough that people aren't going to get confused. Yeah. So, that's okay. Syra. Kyra. Uh, I don't even know how I'm saying it in my head anymore. I start off saying like Kira and then Syra, and then I think Candice, you said that you read somewhere that it was Syra, so I started to. Veronica Roth like says Syra, <laughs> so I'll just call her Syra. Um, Ija, who? <laughs> Not Ija. Oh, the brother. I honestly, I have been saying Eli- Elijah in my head because that's easier than trying to think about what the fuck that name is supposed to be. I think I was saying, like, EJ or something. I don't know. EJ? <laughs> yeah? You know what? Let's <laughs> just go with EJ. We are going to say EJ for the duration of this podcast because it makes life easier for us all. EJ. Okay. I can deal with that. There are a lot of names, so, okay. Uh, let's do one more. Um, so, Ryzek? Ryzek, yeah. 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 Ooh, we agreed on one of them. We're going to just say the names as we think they're said and hope that we don't confuse whoever's listening. So, um, we apologise in advance. So guys, what were your initial thoughts on this book? (laughs) It was a struggle to finish it. There was many a point where I was like, I don't fucking care about a single goddamn character in this series and I just want to be free. Um, (laughs) Yeah, pretty much the same. Like, I finished it this morning at like 8.30 or something. It just wasn't really that captivating, I guess. I just, yeah, I found it hard to like really care about what was going on, unfortunately. It's definitely the sort of book where if I didn't have to finish it for this podcast, I would have put it far, far away from me and never, ever looked at it again. Ever. Ever. <laughs> Yeah, I think even even at the points where, like, it was obviously, like, you were really supposed to be worried about the characters, like, it was these really um, high-tension scenarios, and I was like, I want to care, because, like, I know I should care, and, like, I do feel a bit tense about the situation, but at the same time, I just don't give a fuck about anyone, so, yeah. I feel like we're starting off strong here. We really want people to read this book. <laughs> <laughs> Highly recommend it. No. I mean, it wasn't, like, absolutely terrible. It just wasn't great either. Yeah. I didn't, like, hate it with a passion. I just didn't care about anyone. <laughs> I think I hated it so much because I didn't care. Like, I wasn't reading it and thinking, I really want to know what happens to so-and-so next. I was just like, please be over. Yeah, I think I only started caring, like, towards the last, like, I'm reading it on my Kindle, so, like, the last, like, 20% of the book, and I was like, I just need to know, like, what happens at this point. Like, I don't really care what happens, I just need to know what happens. I was watching the page count on the bottom of the page on my Kobo, and I was like, when it was getting down to, like, 20 pages left, 10 pages left, I was like, (laughs) motherfucker, I forgot that this was the start of a series. 
I think it's just two books, right? It's not like a... Yeah, two books. Not like the selection where there was like a hundred of them. <laughs> it just went on forever. Still, two books feels like two books too many at this point. <laughs> I think I'm going to need to just like get away from this entire thing for a few weeks. Anyway, we should probably um, start looking at it in sections. So I think... The first half makes a good section in itself because the first half is what I had the most problem with because nothing much actually happens or at least it doesn't happen in a way that makes you give a damn. The way that she developed the timeline was very strange. Like the fact that Akos, Akos just like fucks off for two years or whatever. Also I could not keep track of time in this novel. Like, she would be like, oh, that happened a season ago. And I was like, it happened, like, three pages ago. I thought this was, like, a couple weeks. Like, I was like, I have no idea how old these people are. I have no idea how long it's been. Um, but, yeah, in that first half, when she just, like, has the one character, like, fuck off for two years. And I was like, what? How old were they at the end of the book, even? Because wasn't Syra like, I know she was 16 at some point when she went on her first sojourn or something maybe she was, six. That right. she was she was six, six when she went on her oh. first they did mention her being 16 at one point because I did have that in my head and I was like oh they're 16 and then she was like and then it was three seasons I was like wait what are they 19 are they 16 I don't understand I don't understand how she was measuring time in this book it was so <laughs> confusing I know at one point she said that this sojourn was 10 years since her first one yeah but then, like you said, time gets a bit screwy, so I'm not into And also, the sojourn itself, I assume that's did like a fortnight. And then she's like, it's been months. Sorry, how many months? She literally says, it's been months. And I'm like, I think I highlighted it. Let me see if I can find it. So I was just like, but what? No, no, what? Nothing's happened. I would not have thought they spent months on the sojourn. I did like them being on the ship. That was probably my favorite part of the, the book. I was like, yes, they're in space. They're going to see other planets. This is actually interesting. The parts where they were in the capital city of whatever the fuck Kyra's brother rules over were really boring and also very, like, Game of Thrones-y. I was like, this isn't what I signed up for. I signed up for space. <laughs> I came here for the space, damn it. Also, mm. if you're going to write a spa- story set in space and you're just going to make everyone humanoid, like, how boring are you? She never actually says at any point that these people are humanoid, so we're just left to assume that. Like, they could be, you know, upside-down monsters for all we know. I feel like it's a pretty safe assumption. Also, they are described in human terms. I know, but it feels like you should probably explicitly point that out if you're going to set a book somewhere in the depths of space. Maybe I just watched too much Star Trek. But I'm like, I want to (laughs) know what these things look like. Yeah, especially like all the planets that they went to or whatever. It didn't seem like anybody else looked any different in those places either. And then like, like, I feel like the only real physical descriptions we got of them was like occasional mentions of their skin color, which I couldn't even keep track of. I was like, I can't. Between Kyra and Akos, I was like, I don't. I can't keep track of which one of them is pale and which one of them is brown. Was one of them actually described as pale? I don't remember. (laughs) I feel like Akos was at some point. Akos is pale. Okay. That's definitely said at some point because I made a note of that. Syrah is brown. How brown? We don't know. But we're going to come to that. Don't worry. I have a whole rant lined up. I'm saving that for later. I was like, I, I have so many complaints about this, I'm not even really sure where to start. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the whole romance between a uh, captive and his captor, shall we? Because I want to see Candice go, like, blind rage. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, oh. Okay, I hate this trope with a passion. I don't find it romantic in the least because he had no other option really i mean yeah okay we get that he he does like her but then another way of looking at it is that maybe liking her being close to her he knew was his only way to get out so he thinks he likes her more than he actually would under any other circumstances stockholm syndrome is very real yep (laughs) 
their romance, can we address the fact that they are all I love you and kissing and everything after she's had half her face peeled off? Because, like, I think I would find it hard to be romantic after I had a paper cut. Okay? If half my face has been torn off, I'm like, just leave this for later. <laughs> I'm done. I'm pissed off and in pain. Just enough. It was funny, like, the way they described it at the beginning, like, also, like, the way, okay, when they are first, like, she got her face skinned off, the way that she described it was so weird that I thought, like, they'd pulled off the skin off her entire head, and I was like, holy fucking shit! I was like, yeah, I that's know what I to thought, too. Do with this. I was like, that is so gross and horrifying, and I was like, what the fuck? Like, you would die of shock. I was like, I, what? And then they actually got to it and they were like, oh, they only took off half her skin, up, off half her face. I was like, this is still awful. And I still don't understand why you would do this. But yeah, back to their, like, romantic scenes, like that one scene where um, he, like, helps her in the bathtub or whatever, and they were starting to have, like, feelings. I'm just like, yeah. Like, how can you be in that much pain and be like thinking sexy thoughts about someone i'd be like like i don't know like in her condition like there's no way that i would be like thinking about anything like remotely romantic i think it's hard to imagine her feeling romantic at any point in this book because she's supposed to be in crippling pain the entire time and one of my biggest issues with this book is how poorly portrayed that is because sometimes she'll say okay so the shadows the darker they are, the more pain she's in, is what we're told. Mm -hmm. But sometimes she'll have, you know, her skin will go completely dark and she'll be fine. She won't mention the pain, she'll just be getting on with her day. And then other times, you know, the colour will be creeping in and she'll be like, I'm in so much pain, I can't function. Like, be consistent. And either way, are you really going to be all romantic and lovey-dovey when pain is just washing over you constantly? No. You're going to be thinking, fuck this shit. Yeah, I agree. Like, I just think of, like, times I've had, like, a migraine, and all I can do is mm. just, like, lay, like, in a dark room for, like, hours, and, yeah, if I was in, like, constant pain, I don't think I'd ever be thinking anything, like, I'd just be, like, be quiet, don't touch me, get away from me. <laughs> I don't know, I found the whole pain thing very strange. Like, I just, I didn't know what she wanted me to do with half the stuff that she introduced. Like, she'd be like, this is happening, and I'm like, okay, I don't... Like, I don't know what you want from me. Like, I don't know what reaction she was trying to elicit with half the stuff that happened. Mm -hmm. Or, like, I feel... I would read something, and I'm like, I feel like you were trying to make me feel, like, that this is romantic, and I'm just sitting here being like, this is gross. What? Yeah. And then Sarah comes to the realization at the end that she needs to own her pain and accept her pain because her pain has made her stronger. Did I send you guys uh, the links to those articles where Veronica Roth apparently said that this pain thing was based on her friends who had endometriosis, which is a really painful condition and can be debilitating to some people. Um, but then she has Zyra accept her gift and say that it brings her strength and she needs to um, accept that pain to control it, which... But I'm guessing that if someone said to me, I've based this book on your pain, and at the end of the book, I've had this girl say, I need to accept my pain. It makes me stronger. It makes me a good person. I would be raging. I really hope that her friends that she <laughs> apparently based this pain on had a good long talk to her. Yeah. Because I don't, like you said about not knowing how we're supposed to feel, I don't know what she expects us to think about that because I'm not looking at it and going yeah you're right that's a really good idea I'm thinking this poor girl needs some serious mental help yeah like I've never had like any chronic pain issues so I can't really on that level but like you know you get that a lot with mental illness is that people are like oh it makes you stronger like you're supposed to like it's like the struggle makes you a better person and it's such bullshit like no one who's going through any sort of like and also like at work like you see those a lot with cancer patients where they're like, oh, this is making you stronger, like, this is a test, or this is, like, this is just going to make you a stronger person. It's like, no, don't tell someone who's sick that their sickness is making them stronger. Like, that is just such a fucked up thing to say to someone, and to have that be something that, like, is kind of that message that she's putting out through the character, and that being, like, the moral or whatever about Kyra's pain is that she just needed to accept it, 
and accept that it's a part of her and then it makes her stronger or a better person like being in pain makes you a better person like that's bullshit suffering is not necessary to make you a better person and it's not even like we can spin this and say maybe she meant that she's become stronger so she's better able to deal with the pain because that's clearly not true she's had to deal with the pain for the last 10 years and she's dealt with it as best she can so this whole oh, I was going to say last few months but however freaking long it was with ACOS that's not going to have made a significant difference to that because she has been dealing with it so yeah again I don't know how we're supposed to look at this I feel like we're missing something I was really expecting, like, based on the conversation that her and her mother had with that doctor, where the doctor was like, oh, she's, her gift is manifesting this way because she thinks she and the world deserves this pain. And then, like, when she was flashing back to it again, when she was, her brother was making her hurt, Akos, with all that happening, I was really expecting her to be like, this isn't, like, kind of come to that understanding that this isn't what she wanted her gift to be and this isn't how she actually felt about the world. And I was expecting it to change completely. You know, to be something completely different. Not that she would still be in constant pain, but it would be, like, not as bad. Yeah, I thought maybe she would stop feeling the pain herself. And it really would be a tool that she could weld. Like, she could give people pain um, and continue to use it that way. But (sighs) this book, man. This entire book feels like Rana Kara wrote it really quickly. Except the end. The end feels like she maybe gave a bit more time to it. And then she spell-checked it with the help of a very comprehensive personal dictionary. And then said, I'm done. And just never went back, never did any structural editing, never never even checked that her timelines made sense. She just submitted it to her editor, who then... Look, I don't know who her editor is. If they somehow ever listen to this, I apologise in advance. But they fucked up. I don't know what they were thinking, but this just... there's so many inconsistencies but it's not inconsistencies it's continuity errors that's what they're called there's so many continuity errors like again I was like powering through this book to finish it so I wasn't actually taking notes but there were so many times where they would like say something and I would be like that literally contradicts what you just said like three pages ago and like there was a couple times where I would like go back to be like am I reading this like am I reading this too fast am I reading this wrong but there was like a lot of continuity errors like one or two I'd be like okay you know shit happens but like <laughs> there was more than one or two continuity errors I think I just like I didn't I wasn't reading it all in one sitting so maybe I didn't pick up on that as much as I would have if I had read it like how you were reading it so I literally put it down for like half a week and then came back to it I was like oh wait this is still awful <laughs> I have to give her credit a friend who was also reading it at the same time said Cyrus' face gets ripped off. So I, I went back into reading it just like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Sounds good. And then it wasn't. So, you know, it's got that going for it. If you take certain elements in isolation, it sounds like a really good book. Um, but yeah, so the editing just, it feels unfinished. I don't know. I feel like there's just so many, like, there's just so much weirdness in this book. I <laughs> think, like, I just, like, at the beginning, for example, I definitely thought that Akos was, like, supposed to be, like, eight or nine. Yes. And then they're like, oh, he's 14. I was like, he's 14? I was like, why does he speak like he's a small child? He was 14 at the beginning? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I thought that he was a lot, like, <laughs> younger, too. Wow. Right? <laughs> like, it was just like, like, I, she, the way she wrote people, I was like, how... Have you interacted with a child recently? (laughs) But then he keeps calling himself. Later on, he says, I was, you know, I was so young, I was just a kid. It's like, it was two years ago, and you might have apparently had a growth spurt, but when you're 16, you don't look at when you're 14 and think, oh, I was so young. Right? And that was the whole thing with the growth, like, the amount of time that passed. Like, when he saw his mom, and he was like, I bet I look really different now. And she's like, you've grown so much. I'm like, it's been two years. (laughs) Like, oh my god. Like apparently, it's... he has grown, like, two feet and put on loads of muscle. I don't know where that came from, but, you know, that's a plot point. But, like, having a growth spurt is one thing, but they act like, like, the entire book, they act like he's been gone for, like, ten years. And... So, yeah, how long like, I'm were not... they actually gone for? Because I thought it was, like, ten years. <laughs> 
I feel like at the most it was three. I it does kind of feel like when she wrote the book, she meant to have them younger to start with, and then she changed her mind because they all sound quite young. So maybe she meant him to be like eight or nine, and then changed her mind and aged him up. But like I said, it sounds or it feels like she didn't go back to edit anything for consistency afterwards. I kind of feel like her publisher slammed this straight out the door, being like, well, "Make us some money." Not to be too harsh or anything. Yeah, I definitely got, like, the timeline all... Did not get that at all in this book. I definitely thought that he was gone for, like, a decade. Like, that's what it seemed like. Also, like, the fact that she included uh, queer characters just annoyed me. Like, there's two of them. And... Or, like, two couples. And, like, both times I was, I was more annoyed... Because I was like, I feel like you're trying to manipulate me into being happy about this. So I refuse. I'm going to be annoyed about it instead. Okay, I must have missed those. I think it's just because all the names are so fucking weird. That I'm like, I don't know who's male. I don't know who's female. I don't know who's like, I don't know. I try to say the names as best I can. And like follow at least the two main characters <laughs> and what they're doing. Lindsay's like, I'm doing my best, guys. <laughs> Um, no, it was one of uh, Kyra's cousins had a husband, a uh, male cousin had a husband, and then uh, Akos's sister and the Chancellor were... I think I remember the Akos's cousin now. I think I do remember that one, but not the other two. There's way too many people in this. And, like, named characters who didn't need to be named. Mm-hmm. Like, they would, they, like, totally, like, like, so fucking, like... Not even secondary characters, but, like, characters that were barely on the periphery of the stories. And they were like, this is their name. This is their mother's name. This is their father's <laughs> name. This is their entire life story. I'm like, oh, my fucking God, I do not need this much information about characters who are not the main Yeah, characters. I feel like if she had cut some of that out, it would have been easier to follow some things. Fucking Ral. Fucking Ral. She named a character who does nothing. I was going to say who? <laughs> exactly. He is the captain of a a floater. Why did you name them floaters? He's the captain of a floater who literally does nothing as she named him. Oh, yeah. say the captain. He's the pilot who flies them around when they're on the water planet, right? Mm Mm-hmm. You know him. If I just said the guy on the water planet, you probably would have known him. No, she gave him a name. So unnecessary. Also, she has a habit of telling you where characters are not... I, I don't understand it. Like, instead of just saying, so-and-so were in the room. No, she says, so-and-so and so-and-so and so weren't there. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, like, it, it was just so hard to follow what was happening and who was in places. And I, the way that she described, like, even people's bodies and, like, the way they were positioned... Like, as I have this habit, and I do this a lot in fan fiction when I'm reading stuff, and I'm like, this person has an extra limb. Like, I don't know what, how you think he's, like, stroking his hair and cu- cupping his jaw and also touching his ass at the same time, but, like, that's not possible. <laughs> so I do this a lot when I'm reading because I just developed that habit of in fan fiction because writers so often just, I feel like, do not actually think about the way their characters are moving in fan fiction. So I've gone into that habit, and then, which I don't normally have to do with a real novel because it's been edited but this one apparently wasn't, so there was just so many times where she's describing the characters, and I'm like, I don't understand what you think they're doing with their limbs right now. There was a bit at the end where Akos is holding Cece's? Mm-hmm. I have a lisp, that is a horrible name. Um, he's holding her hand so that she can cry, but then she's also holding um, Issei's hands, but then she's also like moving her hair out her face. This girl must be an octopus, because I don't know what's going on. Well, I mean, maybe they are all octopuses. <laughs> like we were saying before, she never actually described them properly, so if they could have, like, three or four arms. <laughs> I found that sentence, by the way, that I was complaining about before. This is a sentence, okay? Water planet, they walk to a room, and this is what happens. Ryzek, Ima, Vas, Suzeo, and Aija weren't there. But Vakras and Malin were. <laughs> Just say, only Vakras and Malin were in the room. You read those character lists too, and I'm like, I have no fucking clue who any of those people are. Okay, Vakras and Malin, are they the ones that are married? Yes. 
good because I couldn't remember the names <laughs> before. So now I know. But the others, like Suzelle, I'm sure that he or she did stuff in the book, but I can't remember and I don't care. This is totally changing tracks, but just um, since you're talking about named characters and it made me think about the woman whose husband and daughter got killed, which I didn't understand her motivation the entire time. I was like, fucking no idea what's going on there. But that made me think about the final, like, whatever. I have no fucking clue what happened at the end of the book. Yeah, what was that woman's name? I feel like it started with a Y. Yes, I was like, I feel like it started with an A. No, I feel like it was something with a Y. Yama? Is it like... Yama? Oh, I've been saying Yima, or Yima. Yima. I think that's what I was saying. We we couldn't actually remember what her name was, so... (laughs) She's not on this character list here yeah. that I'm looking at. There's another Y name, and I was like, no, it's not her. Okay, if she was, like, deep, deep undercover or whatever, and she's like, oh, I betrayed my husband because, like, you know, he was dying anyways, wouldn't she have fucking told her daughter that? Like, she let her daughter, like, challenge and fight yeah. to the death. Why? Why would you do that? Why would you put yourself in that situation? Like, why, if you want to get in with him, like, why... I hadn't even noticed that, but that is that. Yeah, but, oh, I, her entire character's motivation didn't make sense. That whole thing felt again like she decided it after the fact, like it came to her. She was writing, and then I thought, but you've mentioned the tapping before, so either that was actually something you'd laid groundwork for, or you just thought, you know what, I'm just going to give her tapping meaning. Or you actually went back and added it in, and that last one didn't seem very likely. It seemed like far too much work given the lack of editing in this book. Yeah, I fuck if I know what was happening there. And like, I know that like everything not making sense at the end is meant to like create suspense and make me want to read the next book. But mostly it was just annoying. I was like, I don't like you have all these prophecies that are supposed to be like fixed fates. And then you have people doing something completely different, left, right, and center. And the whole oracles thing bothered me. And just just so many things did not make sense, were unnecessary, or just were like shoved in there like she thought of them last minute and was like, yeah, sure, why not? Some of the characterization I felt was a bit, it was a bit dodgy. No, I'd agree with that. I, okay. Sorry, I was just thinking about how much I don't care about any of the characters, and then I was thinking about how weird... What did we decide to call him? A- EJ? Yeah. EJ? Yeah. EJ's uh, plotline was. And then I was like, you know what? Also, what else bothered me? Well, because, partially because I was kept thinking that um, Akos was like eight at the beginning of the book. But like, the whole thing where he was like, I'll save you. I'm like, that is your fucking big brother. What the fuck? Like... I was so angry at each for most of the book for just not, like, not rescuing his little brother that I was just like, his entire quest to save him, I was like, no! That is the opposite order! Yeah, I was just thinking, like, what did whatever his name is, EJ or whatever, like, actually do besides, like, he was mostly, like, catatonic the whole time, I felt like. Or at least it seemed that way, like, I don't know. He was supposed to be, like, a oracle, too, and I don't, did he predict anything? Like, I don't think he actually did anything for all whatever 500 pages of this book. He did some predictions, but I don't think we were actually told them. Like, one of them was that um, Issei and Ori had to be killed in a certain order, and we weren't told which, which I guess was supposed to build suspense. But I was like, I don't give a damn. Like, we have no reason to care about Thuv's Chancellor because Thieves seem to be getting on all right, and we're told that sometimes they have no chancellor. They just have, like, representatives. So it's like, well, if their chancellor dies, they're not going to fall apart. So, okay. <laughs> Do what you want. When uh, Akos goes to rescue Ege, um, and he comes into the room, and Ege is just like, oh, I'm so sad. I was like, ah. Uh, I was like, I, that was, I think, the point where I went from not caring about him to actively disliking him, because I was like, you are taking no like drive in rescuing yourself like the passivity the entire time like I mean Akos is like okay apparently 14 but he kills someone when they're taking him like he actively tries to fucking do something 
from the time when they come home and find the men in their house, whereas each is just like doing fuck all. It just he pissed me off so much. Yeah. I still can't like were they really was he really fourteen at the end of the book? I don't At the end of the book I think he was sixteen or seventeen. Oh, that's like slightly better. Who knows? <laughs> He could be 25 for all we know. <laughs> True. Time has no meaning is the real moral of this story. That That is what Roth was trying to prove the whole time, is that time has no meaning. Um, oh, fuck, what was I thinking about? Is something with each. Oh, yeah. That was the other thing. It was that at the beginning, um, because Akos was having, like, such a, like, like, I guess, calm not calm, but, like, he was being really good under the pressure of the situation of finding the soldiers in his house and, like, reacting to that. So when he said his brother's name, I thought he was throwing the men off of his sisters, because also, who knows who's the older one? Not me, because Roth could not be any less clearer about anything in the entire fucking book. Who knows what's happening at any given point? So I really thought that, like, he had lied about which one was his older sibling, and that we were gonna find out that EJ, EJ, had no, uh, he didn't have sight or whatever, and no matter what, what his fuck did, like, he wasn't gonna magically get him to, like, tell him prophecies because he didn't have the gift for prophecy. And then that was not fucking true, and I was like, well, I don't fucking know what you're doing, Ross. It seems like that was the plan, because she purposely, like, the dad would call them, like, what was it, little, littler, littlest or something? Yeah. And he never pointed out which one it was. It's like she's purposefully trying to cause us to think that, and then it went nowhere. Yeah, I think I was thinking that too, and then I lost interest at some point and was like, I don't care anymore. <laughs> I care about nothing. I am dead inside. Congratulations, Roth. You have broken us all. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Before we get away from Eja or Ej or Ej or whatever his name is, do either of you understand how um, the whole memory swapping thing worked? Because when uh, oh god, Rosek traded memories with Ej or Ej, whatever, it made Ej more like Rosek. But he trades them, as in he gets memories from Eja, happy memories. So why didn't Ryzek become nicer and more like Eja? I didn't understand the mechanics of that. You know what, I wondered that as well. And then also like when he took that memory from Kyra at the beginning and we like learned about how his power worked, she said that like she knew that she had done it, but she didn't have the feelings associated with it so it was less that he takes the memory and more that he takes the feelings associated with it so in that sense I also didn't understand like I could understand how each would care about his brother less because the emotions associated with his memory of his brother are going away but it was that like the way it was written is that he didn't remember him anymore like he didn't remember all this stuff that they'd done together and I was like but that's not how you said it works yeah yeah I think that was just another thing that I just stopped caring about after a point, because I was like, I don't get it, this makes no sense. <laughs> the end. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much my summary for the book. <laughs> just a long series of things that Lindsay stopped giving a fuck about. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I don't know, I feel like my general, like, reaction to this book is confusion. It's not even, like, really active dislike. It's just, like, I don't know what she was doing. I don't know what I was supposed to take away with it from this. I'm just... I am just lost. I'm at a loss. Yeah. After talking to you guys, apparently, I didn't read this, like, right at all. I was, like, I thought that, like, it had been, like, a decade, that they must have been in their, like, 20s by now. Like, <laughs> it made more sense for, like, the romance if they'd been together that long instead of just, like, three years. But, Yeah. Well, they weren't even yeah. together for three years. Yeah, he because was, he was off yeah. in the camp or whatever, being trained by the uncle, which also I was like, oh, something horrible is going to happen to him there. And then he came back, he was like, nah, I just like trained for two years and got a little bit muscly, but like not really well trained because then she still had to teach him how to fight. And like he killed a giant beast in the whatever and got armor. And I was like, I don't understand what the fucking point of him being gone at this train camp for two years was if he didn't learn how to fight properly and if nothing that bad happened to him there like that he didn't have any like PTSD from being there I was like what is the point of this you just wanted him to fuck off for two years after he'd been captured for what reason exactly 
Yeah, and why would you capture someone and then have them trained to fight? Right? Just because it's, like, his uh, destiny to die in service doesn't mean that he's going to, like, as soon as you train him, he's just going to be like, yes, I will fight for you. Like, it's not like he actually kidnapped him when he was eight, in which case they might have had time for brainwashing to set in. Yeah. He captured him when he was 14, which, like, at which point, you know, you're pretty fucking know where your loyalties lie. Yeah. So, like, that was another thing. I'm just like, why? I mean, I guess if they wanted him to, like, be in the army or something, but then he was just, like, whatever, Cyrus, like, personal handholder. And I'm like... <laughs> that relationship dynamic was weird. Like, the way that was set up when they were like, oh, you're there to relieve her pain. But, like, he wasn't restrained in any way. But, like, because, like, her powers didn't work on him. But he wasn't, and he wasn't restrained in any way. He was, like, sleeping a couple doors down from her. Or he wasn't locked in at night or anything like that. And they were like, oh, yeah, just hang out with her and touch her. And I was like, this is weird. I was like, this is weird. I don't know. Like, what? <laughs> And why did they immediately go for hand-holding? Like, the holding of the arm came afterwards, but start with that! I don't know, the entire way the relationship between them developed was weird. It felt like it was too short for Akos to decide he didn't hate her anymore. And also, like, he never seemed to hate her- like, the, the way he interacted with her was never like he was a prisoner. And it wasn't like he was a defiant prisoner. It was just like he was like, oh, no, you're just like someone I met on the street at home. Like, his tone was weird. Like, the way he talked to her was always so weird. It didn't fit either a broken prisoner or a defiant prisoner. It was like he wasn't really friends with her, but he didn't, like, really actively dislike her because he wasn't very rude to her at any given point or really sullen. He was just kind of like, every once in a while, it would be like, oh, but you killed my father. And she would be like whatever and then that was nothing i don't oh guys i just don't know yeah i think i just like i don't know like they didn't treat him like he was a prisoner at all like that's what i don't get like they just kind of like brought him along we're like well here you go like you can do this for a while and like i don't know it seems like in any other like book where there's a prisoner or something there are I don't know. It's not how you would expect an enemy country or whatever to treat someone that they captured from, like, the people that they, like, despise. A way that he could have been treated that would have made it so much more sense to me is that he was taught, you know, sent to this camp for training, whatever. It doesn't make sense. Moving past that. And then, like, if Kyra's brother actually cared about her and they, like, realized what his gift was and they, like, immediately rushed him back to the capital and, like, kept him, like, bound but near her so that she could instigate touch when she wanted. Yeah. That was the other thing is that he was the one instigating it most of the time. Yeah. It was way too overly familiar. But yeah, if it had been more something that he was forced to do and less like like he was just like randomly following her around <laughs> like a lost puppy for no fucking reason because he would have no motivation to do it. He wasn't being forced to. It was so fucking weird. It's not even like they could be like, oh, we're gonna kill your brother. He's like, no, you're fucking not, because he's, you know, you're Oracle, and you, like, fucking wanted him so badly, you decided to go into Iceland. The land of ice, <laughs> with the fucking flowers, and fucking shit. Fuck, those fucking grasses. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, I don't, why did the, why did they even care about having, um, Akos to, like, relieve Syrah's pain or whatever? It's like, not like her brother cared about her at all. Like, why would he care? No. <laughs> and he seemed to be mostly, like, really amused when she'd be, like, super fucking doped out just to deal with it, like... And surely she was more used to him like that, because he could manipulate yeah. her more. Right? Like, yeah. when she's less in control of her facilities. And it's not like he could have been like, oh, they'll fall in love and then he'll be something I can use against her. Like, you can't fucking... It's not like he would have predicted that because each wasn't giving him any predictions at that time <laughs> because he hadn't started doing the fucking mind swap thing, which also like still doesn't make sense. You can't see, but Yensina has her head in her hands. We have feelings, so many feelings. They're just all confusion. That's all it is. Is I don't care and I'm confused. Can we talk just for a moment about how the world building for everything apart from the people just didn't make sense either? So the show Tet. They travel around space, they find a planet, decide to settle down, fine. Except it's said that, uh, well firstly, all these planets are in one solar system. All the livable planets. There are broken planets on the rim, which, what the fuck? 
There are no planets around any other stars. None of this makes sense. It just, if you just... Oh, I can't cope. <laughs> and yet, yeah, I'm gonna read the second book. Fuck my life. I, okay. I really didn't understand the the red flowers, you know, that only bloomed and they were like ice flowers, but they were like a specific type. And when she was describing the blooming, like I was trying to picture it so hard in my head and I don't understand, like were they growing in the ice? Because exactly. in the ice or below the ice? Because that's what it sounded like. And I was like, I don't understand. Like, ice is solid. <laughs> Are they in air pockets? <laughs> like, it's stuff like that where like they give you time, like she gives you time to think about it. And it becomes more and more absurd the more you think about it. And she doesn't explain it enough that you're like, oh, I just accept this. Because that is a lot of sci-fi is just them being like, this is the way it is. And explaining in a logical enough manner that you're like, I accept this. We can move forward. This is part of the world building. I'm good with this. But she doesn't explain anything. And she just, like, names things for no fucking reason. She's got the fucking floaters, which, like, fuck off. The best name in the entire book, all right? This is from... A woman who says, like, leave his body to the carrion, okay? But what does she call their version of chicken? She calls it dead bird. <laughs> I almost lost my shit at that point. I couldn't, I could deal. Dead bird. Yeah, I was mad that, like, what was it? The ice flower and the hush flower and, like, she came up with all these, like, ridiculous names for, for the characters. And then, like, a flower, like, she couldn't give a more imaginative name to what was the grass called? Feather grass. Honestly. Okay, what did you guys think about the current? I don't think I understood the point of that either, to be honest. <laughs> it really, I think it really bothered me because it felt like it was magical realism being shoved into a sci-fi novel. If it had a specific purpose, but it didn't do anything, and it wasn't like it was just to power, say, the magic of the flowers. It was supposed to be inside all of them, inside the entire planet. And it's like, well, it's not actually doing anything for you, so what's the point? I'm assuming we're going to learn that it was the current that brought Syra back to life or something in the second book. Really, my favourite part of the book was when they were on the sojourn ship and they were, like, going through space and through the current and, like, when they w passed through the current. Like, that was so cool and interesting and then it was bracketed by so much awful. That entire scene, why wasn't it from Syra's point of view? Because then we would know what she was feeling. Because Akos is like, they go through, she goes completely black. She looks like she might actually enjoy it. He's not quite sure. So shouldn't it have been from her point of view so we could see what she was feeling? And understand her link to the current? Who knows, Candies? Who knows? Nothing has meaning. <laughs> Everything is nonsense. Okay, can we get to the racism now? Because... Yes. <laughs> mentioning that. Just... Oh, it's Candice's time it's... to put her head in her hands. <sighs> it's bugging me. Okay. All right. There are two things to this, okay? So, um, online there have been, I think, a couple of people who have said that this book is racist. And there have been a lot of people who said it's not racist. There is absolutely no way racism was intended, etc., etc. So, um, yeah, I'm going to preface this by saying that I don't think racism was intended. Um, aside from the really weird comment about that guy's skin apparently looking like dirt, having the colour of dirt, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gloss over that. I don't think she meant to be racist, so we're just, we're putting that on the table, okay? That's point number one. But the second point is that this is a case of, it's, and I don't, I don't mean this in a racist way myself now, bear with me white author obliviousness where they just write about something that they have no understanding of so I think if you look at the racism from the point of view of when Syra is dark when her shadows have taken over and she is as is described black she is in pain and it's horrible and terrible and she can't get any relief when she's happy or um, when Akos is touching her which I mean that's a whole fucking thing in itself she is light. Yeah, she's light brown, but she's light. There is still a huge amount of racism in this book because we are constantly being told that Syra, when she's dark, when that shadow is taking over her, when her skin is darkening, it's terrible. 
but then when you know it eases up and she's lighter that's good um and I, I suppose you could say at the end that when she decides I have to accept this pain it's part of me and everything you could say well you know she's she's accepting that and it's not terrible anymore so that's fine but it's not it's because it's not that she's saying when I look like this I'm okay she's saying I can deal with it for now until you know um, I find a way to get rid of it or <sighs> I'm not using it against other people so it's okay which again you know I'm not but she's not using her blackness against other people yeah you get what I'm saying it's a really yeah it's hard to describe but it's it is basically boiling down to black is bad lighter is good and that lighter may not be white but it's still racist so I can totally see where criticism came from um in this book and I didn't actually notice myself I was reading it and I got to halfway and I was like I'm not seeing much racism and then it took a while for it to click in my head and I was just I couldn't not see it once I'd noticed and I I'm guessing that this didn't go through many readers before it went to print not least because of the editorial issues but I'm sure somebody else if they had given this book to a person of color I'm sure they would have at least said you know there, there's something not quite right here maybe you should look at this um and it's made worse by the fact that i don't know about you guys i don't think the fact that her skin gets darker actually added to it the plot in any way whatsoever i think it would have been she would have been more dangerous if there were no outside changes if you had this girl who looked completely normal but she touched someone and they were in agony you'd be like well shit because you know i don't know when she's most dangerous i don't want to go near her just in case i provoke her because i won't know that i'm provoking her the the skin thing was sort of it's it's the bad side of ya when you try to be you know clever and you just end up being obvious for the wrong reasons it didn't add and it didn't um enhance the story i think if anything it made the story weaker um, and that's outside of the racism thing. I think when you add that in, it was just, it, it was, it was fucking awful. And that's <laughs> my rant done. <laughs> ah, that's good. And this is definitely, you know, white privilege in action. Uh, cause I'd heard like people being like, oh, this is racist. And I was like, okay, like going into that it, with that knowledge. And I finished the book and I was like, and you had mentioned that racism too, and I was like, I'm really interested to hear what Candice says about this, because I was like, I don't see it. And then literally, as soon as you said, when she's black, she's in pain, I was like, oh, fuck. Yep, <laughs> there it is. That is what it is. Which, yeah, like, Roth might not have meant that it, like that, because, like, fucking white people are oblivious. You know, case in point. But that's still such a fucking, like, fucked up and dangerous message to put out there, even, like subconsciously for like readers who are people of color and readers who are white because no matter what even if it's not explicit you're still picking up on that and you're still learning that and it's still reinforcing that dynamic yeah i don't think there was like any good way that she could have written that character like whether she got rid of like the current shadows thing and like making her like black and lighter or whatever like then it still goes back to like what we were talking about before with like having it based off of her friends that had the endometriosis because you're still doing like you know still still pretty able yeah <laughs> so i don't i don't know how she could have made that better in any way yeah i'm it really couldn't have gone through many readers because this stuff would have been picked up on i mean there's only three of us here and we've picked up on this between us this is why i really feel like every major publishing house should really have probably a black woman <laughs> in like one of the <laughs> highest roles who's always checking things because there's so much like okay one of my friends the other uh week she went and saw the lego batman movie and she was telling me i mean she lives out in the like suburbs so she's surrounded by white people and she was like my family was the only like black family in the theater and she was saying like at the beginning the screen's black and it says everything like when you know it's a black when a movie starts in black you know it's bad and at the end, the screen's white, and they were like, you know, when it ends in whiteness, you know, everything's fine mm -hmm. again. And she was like, so I didn't enjoy it. And I was like, yep, that's uh, pretty explicit and pretty fucked up uh, framing of a narrative. Um, so it's just stuff like that where you're like, well, clearly, like, and it's not just like having people of color on a, like a ground level. 
because then they're not like necessarily in a position where you're going to feel like your voice is going to be heard or like if you're that you might get fired by your white bosses or that like, just that sort of whole entire system pushing down it's unique really 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 fucking neat probably women of color preferably women of color in really high up positions in organizations so that you don't have shit like that happen or at the very least just get yourself a nice roster of sensitivity readers i mean that's not going to be hard and it's going to be cheap and they could do that straight away like they could do it tomorrow if they wanted just find a bunch of people who like to read who know what they're talking about and just be like read this book please and help <laughs> there are people that would do it for free books <laughs> come on but you don't think tackling the entire systemic hierarchy of racism is the quickest and easiest solution I'm not even going to justify that with an answer. <laughs> I, I'm too busy just hating this book with a vengeance to deal with anything that big right now. Come on, Candice. It's just, it's just a small, small goal. But yeah, before we get hate, just stress again, I don't think that Veronica Roth did this on purpose. But, you know... The pain thing, though. Can we not give her a pass on the pain thing? No, that was I'm happy to give her a pass on the racism thing, because <laughs> maybe she just didn't see it. And, you know, whatever, okay? At this point, I'm just done with that whole thing. But <laughs> pain... I'm hoping her friends are calling her out on the pain, because that's just... That is a shitty friend. I'm sorry. You are definitely the only person on this team who could say, I'll forgive the racism. <laughs> <laughs> And not instantly get lynched for it. Um, justifiably. Uh, oh, fuck, now I've forgotten what point I was going to Sorry. Make. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, um, I think it comes down to, for the racism thing, it comes down to whether or not you believe intent matters. Woo! Sorry, almost yanked my computer off my desk. Whether or not you th- I need to stop gesturing so much. Whether or not you think intent matters... And I would argue that it doesn't, especially in stuff like this. Like, I don't care if you were like, oh, I didn't mean to be racist. Like, the effect of what you did still exists, and that's still something you need to apologize for, whether you meant it or not. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Cool. Seriously, though. Okay, I say I'm going to give her a pass, but how can you write that someone, when they're black... They are in pain. I, I take it back. I'm not giving her a pass. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's been revoked. It's just it's hurting my very soul. That is really fucked up. Oh god. I mean, she must have like non-white friends who she gave this book to at some point, right? Because even if she didn't think about that aspect, like. Syrah is still apparently not white. So you'd want a friend who's a person of colour to just, you know, give an eyes over, wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. Maybe she doesn't have any, though. Which is a whole issue in itself. Yeah. But we shall leave that there. Whole other kettle of fish. And if you, like, think about it, like, it's a, they're, like, fucking space people, like, from another planet. Like, she could have picked, like, any, anything. Like, why... Like, she could have avoided all this completely. Like, I don't know. Syrah could have gone blue. Blue is their colour. Why didn't she go blue? Then she just looked like she had an oxygen deficiency, but you know. That's another thing, speaking of, like, them being in space, you can do whatever you want. Why is it when authors are like, this is uh, in space, this is a fantasy world, but everyone is still white? I know, that I know, like... We've had this discussion before, and there's like a whole other a lot of factors in there, but it just every time I'm like, why do you do this? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they could have been like anything. I guess like isn't what's one of them? Is it Star Trek or something where they they are like from Earth or something, but like descendants of humans? <laughs> but it's like not every friggin' sci-fi book or whatever is that they like came from Earth. Like they're not gonna look like us. It's I don't know. It annoys me. <laughs> I, I love your your description of Star Trek. It's so natural. <laughs> oh, bless. 
Listen, Kendi, it's not everyone can be as nerdy as you. You're setting the bar really fucking high, and not all of us can achieve it. It's adorable. I'm sorry. <laughs> of course, when you think that people came from Earth, I'm always thinking of, like, Battlestar Galactica and Firefly, so I'm not sure I can talk shit about nerdiness. <laughs> What's our concluding point here? <laughs> This book is shit, and we are done with it. White people need to not. White people need to not. Veronica Roth needs a better editor, and I still don't understand half the stuff that happened in this book. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> and I don't understand why I'm. I'm. I know I'm going to read the second one. I know I'm. I'm going to rage, and it's going to be awful. <sighs> Why do you do this to me, Veronica Roth? Anyway, we should end by scoring this book, I think. Let's bring in a new a new element to these reviews. Um, so if you guys had to give it a score out of five, what would you give it? I think I gave it two stars on Goodreads, which... I, I mean, I always feel mean giving things one star. Unless I, like, really fucking hated them. But I'm not sure it's really worthy of two stars. I feel like maybe one star is an appropriate rating. Yeah. For overall yeah. badness. For overall badness. One star. Yeah. My initial thought was, like, maybe two. But it's hard to say because I was just confused the whole time. So I don't know if it even deserves that much because... Like, there's just so much shittiness about certain things, and then just, like, mostly just confusion. So, one or two stars. Two, if I'm gonna be nice. I was gonna say two. I actually did ponder for a while three, but I think I just felt bad for saying two. But now I'm gonna bump it down to one. Because, you know what, I know Veronica Roth probably put a lot of time and effort into this book, but it doesn't feel like it, so done. One star. I'm not sure she put a lot of effort into it. Is that too mean? <laughs> I mean, it's hard to write even a really bad book. It does take a lot of effort. Uh, your effort may be misplaced. <laughs> but I'm, I'm gonna give her that. That's, that's the most she's gonna get from me. I know she put in some hours, so uh, she can get one star for that. One or two hours. <laughs> Right, okay, so. Should we say something nice? I feel like we should say something nice. Just to end on a high. Like about the so. book? Something nice about the book? <laughs> I mean, if you can manage it. I like the description of Kyra's room on the sojourn ship. <laughs> that was short and sweet. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's all I've got. <laughs> um... I mean, it was good that there was, like, maybe two names that we could agree on how to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> okay, these are, like, the bitchiest nice things. <laughs> the worst thing is, the only thing in my notes that I could find that I thought would be nice to say is, well, the current would have been nice if it had actually worked out in any way. <laughs> so the idea was nice. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. Yikes. <laughs> we tried. <laughs> we I'm not sure we tried. did, but I'm not sure Roth did, so. Fun. Fun. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, so I think that's us done. Uh, this will probably be an hour long episode by the time I finish editing it. Um, yeah, so. <sighs> I'm almost reluctant to say this, but if you have any comments. You can find us on Twitter at Nice Young People. Please don't send too much hate our way because, frankly, I'll probably cry. I mean, <laughs> this book is too much. I'll probably just crack and just cry and never come back to this again. So, um, <laughs> but I kind of just want like someone to say that they like absolutely <laughs> loved it, just so I can see like what the hell they saw in this whole thing. What kind of person <laughs> are you? <laughs> there is bound to be someone. <laughs> anyway, so you can find me on Twitter at many choirs, M-A-N-Y-Q-U-I-R-E-S. 
And you can find me on Twitter at Eden Burned, E-D-E-N-B-U-R-N-E-D. And I'm on Twitter at Lindsay42, and that's Lindsay with a Z, so L-I-N-D-Z-E-Y 42. If you managed to stick out this entire episode, thank you. We appreciate it. I mean, I'm not sure it was good for your mental health, but hey, it was an hour spent doing something, wasn't it? Yeah, we're going to let you go. Thanks for listening. Uh, Come back next week for something a bit cheerier. Yay. Um, And goodbye. Bye. Bye. Go.